Oh, it's around. All right. All right, folks. Um, so, you know, uh, there, um, I, I think sometimes there are cultural sensitivities to snakes. There will be a, at least one image of a snake, uh, maybe two in this set of slides. So just letting you know for those that have those sensitivities. Um, but otherwise, today back, you know, the, the bottom half of our introductory unit, um, before we talked about kind of like what is behavior, and this is a little bit about what are the boundaries of behavior and are there any boundaries is kind of what we're talking about here before we start going into specifics um, in the next unit. So some reminders, these uh, AREs, the reading assignment on perusal and the uh, comprehension assignment are both due on Sunday. Again, lowest two of the AREs, lowest five of the comprehension or drop. Uh, the um, uh, the AREB is already available, and that'll be due a week from Sunday. And uh, I will put together the comprehension assignment for Unit B uh, probably over the weekend, so then that should be available very soon. Uh, so that's the only assignments to worry about at the moment. Last time we left off talking about what is behavior and the difficulty in defining it and how there have been different groups that have defined behavior in different ways. And so um, this is an example from Marlene Zook pointed out. So she is an animal behaviorist and she was pointing out that psychologists like to use this dead man test. And so it's, um, you know, I like to put this, to pit these kind of two things together because she effectively comes from a tradition uh, known as ethology and uh, psychologists um, uh, originally were, you know, she calls it this modern behaviorist come from a tradition called behaviorism that um, later got kind of rejected by psychology uh, and in favor of something called cognitive science due to a, primarily a guy named Noam Chomsky. Uh, but, um, and so you can kind of summarize that here. So these are like kind of these like two classical ways of thinking about behavior is the kind of psychology case of behaviorism where we're focusing, uh, the, the focus of behaviorism is not on any assertion that there are mental states, that there's not these latent variables that are inside your head that you need to describe behavior. In theory, all you need for behaviorism is to look externally at the outside world, potentially at a history of interactions in the outside world, in the case that there's any plasticity or or learning, but uh, but you if you know if you can watch an animal behave and you can know what that animal has been experienced with, that's all you need to know. And the big focus here was really you know modifications of behavior. So why do animals and humans? So this was uh, another area that was related to this is is comparative psychology. So studying non-human animals to learn about human psychology. And in, in this case, the real focus was learning. So you brought birds inside laboratories, you had them peck on levers. Uh, there was an important figure, B.F. Skinner, uh, who was sort of a champion of behaviorism or an aversion of behaviorism, he called radical behaviorism. How many people have heard of a Skinner box? So yeah, it's an, like a box that you put an animal into that it has levers that it can be trained that when certain stimuli show up, it could poke different levers and either get rewarded or not rewarded. And so um, Skinner uh, came up with operant conditioning was, you know, so you had Pavlov before that, you know, with the, um, the where classical conditioning that we'll talk more about this when we get to learning later on in the semester, but uh, Skinner was, you know, created this operant conditioning. And the point I'm trying to get with all this is that the behaviorists really were focused on not the environment, not the outside environment, not na animals in their natural world, but more how much could we explain about changes in behavior by looking at how, what stimuli were being exposed to those animals over time. Um, that can contrast a little bit with ethology, which uh, now lately ethology has taken on a more broader meaning. So, uh, you know, an ethologist nowadays just means somebody who studies animal behavior in kind of a more modern perspective. But the kind of classical ethology here was focused less on the learning and the behavior modification, but more on a lot of the innate behaviors 
in response to a natural environment. So the big thing here is the ethologist would be largely critical of someone just taking an animal out of its environment, putting it into a laboratory setup, and then training it to do something artificial. An ethologist really says, no, behavior only makes sense within the natural context of the animal. And so if you're doing experiments, you need to be modifying around that natural context. And so it's, you know, so it's almost like here, you're focusing on how the insides of the animal change. Here, you're focusing on an animal that is roughly static and how the outside changes. And so to what extent is the environment and the stimuli the important thing? So much more ecologically, or eth you know, ethology is looking out at the environment whereas behaviorism is looking in at the animal. Um, and so there's, you know, there was some contrast here, but, you know, both of them stand in stark contrast to modern cognitive science, which is, you know, a, a theory of behavior where you have to actually assert that someone is happy or sad, or so you're asserting these things that are unobservable, and that's the only way that you can then make these theories move. Here, everything is observable in both cases here. So the other uh, contrast here is I would say, you know, the ethology largely has been a focus on mechanisms. And so initially, ethology was less about the why questions, but more about how does this mechanism work in this environment? So how does this animal see? What is this animal smelling? Uh, you know, what senses is this animal using in order to, for this behavior? Um, Nico Timbergen uh, was, you know, he did these studies with, uh, I think, galls that had this little pink spot on the end of their beaks. And he showed that, uh, that the, the, the gall chicks, whenever you showed them a pink spot around the right size, they would open up their mouths expecting to get fed. So that was like, okay, so the, those, those birds are looking for that pink spot. That's a so-called releaser of the behavior. And even if that pink spot is on a big, thick pencil or something like that, as long as it's roughly the right shape and the right color, you get the same opening behavior. So it's about these, these mechanisms here. So whereas I mentioned Skinner is sort of the big behaviorist we talk about. Down here, the ethologists we hear about are, you know, Nico Timbergen, Carl von Frisch, Conrad Lorenz, and um, and Jacob von Uxkel, who uh, is is uh, is going to be the sort of founder of a sort of a strange word that we behaviorists like to use that I'll introduce here in a few slides. So these are kind of classical behavior, um, but then what we kind of rounded out at the end of uh, at, at the end of last uh, the lecture was that really what Timbergen started to realize is that, you know, you really have to take kind of an integrative approach and not just be thinking about the mechanism. And really, you need to kind of take the kind of Dobrzanski uh, approach where you, you need to combine that with evolution and really be thinking about, you know, what, you know, where did these things come from? And they could come from different spots. And that kind of is what came up with the you know, Timbergen's four here. And this kind of integration of Timbergen's four into behavior is what we now sort of view as behavioral ecology. So behavioral ecology has grown out of these ideas of behavior that were more kind of more narrowly focused in this more integrative perspective where we are forced to deal with the environment, we're forced to deal with animals that are learning as well as animals that have innate uh, uh, behaviors. Um, all of these things together might be important and that's what we're kind of bundling up together into behavioral ecology. So that's kind of what we mean. Nowadays, behavioral ecology is sort of synonymous with ethology. It kind of depends on the tradition you come from. Some people like being called an ethologist more than a behavioral ecologist. Uh, but, you know, formally when these things were coming about, then behavioral ecology was much more of this kind of holistic approach, whereas ethology was a little bit more mechanistic. And then the psychologist had the kind of their behaviorism. But now a lot of psychologists have kind of gotten rid of their behaviorism and, um, and it's sort of become much more like a behavioral ecologist. Like it's the behaviorism almost feels like a much more non-human way to study things. And the human way that psychologists study things is with this cognitive psychology, which we'll touch on again uh, a little bit more when we get into learning and cognition. So anyways, those are the three terms I want you to sort of be familiar with, behaviorism, ethology, and behavioral ecology. 
So are there any questions about those, those terms? It's not super important, to you, but I want you to be familiar that these terms exist. There are differences, um, but the kind of most encompassing, you know, the, the when in doubt, behavioral ecology is a good thing to go to. Okay. All right, so that's kind of like what where we left off. And the big uh, picture that I was hoping to communicate was that uh, even if you're thinking about function, uh, there is a series of constraints, phylogenetic, evolutionary, and developmental, that end up selecting for a smaller set of mechanisms that can provide that function and probably provide it in not a perfect way. And it is these constraints, the constraints of your evolutionary baggage and the constraints of being a big complex organism that has to be built from a very small uh, start, those two things together are going to be, you're going to greatly affect the mechanisms that you're allowed to use in order to, to have this behavior that, that does this particular function. And, um, and, you know, so the, you know, the, you know, that gives us the diversity that we see today. So why do we have diverse ways of seeing, diverse ways of flying, diverse ways of speaking or to calling and signaling. Um, it largely is because different organisms have been forced to go down different routes and they have different constraints. And so that's, they have different tools that they can use. And so they work around the edges with the tools they got. And then so you end up with a vertebrate that has a blind spot and a cephalopod that doesn't. It would sure be nice to have a cephalopod eye and not have that blind spot, but our brains seem to make do with the blind spot, and uh, and that's fine. And this is much this is something we can actually build with our neurological development. Whereas the cephalopod has a different way that it develops that allows it to build this way. They look very similar, but you know we get the diversity because the developmental pathways. It's that's you know we don't have different eyes because they're doing different things. We have different eyes because we have different development. And, uh, and that's what I think is really cool. So that was a key message from last time. The other key message was the general scientific process. So, uh, you know, we see an interesting observation and that causes us to pose a causal question. So it is a question that sort of says, how did that happen? What, or why is that happening? And once we have that causal question, then we come up with hypotheses, which are our guesses at answers to those questions. And we don't have any evidence to support one guess over another. And so we need to gather data. And so the lack of evidence is why their hypothesis, a uh, thesis is something you defend with data. And so in order to get that data, we build an experiment. And then we ask, once we've built the experiment, if the hypothesis is correct and we ran that experiment, then what would we predict under that hypothesis? And then we actually run the experiment and see if that prediction happens. If the prediction doesn't happen, then that hypothesis was probably a bad guess. And we move on to a different hypothesis. If we're clever, then in one experiment, we can hopefully be testing multiple hypotheses simultaneously. So when we look at the outcome, it'll filter all of those hypotheses so that we're left with a fewer number of hypotheses than we started with. And that is basically how we gain knowledge in science, is by kicking out hypotheses until we're left with a few that hopefully we can discriminate against. But, you know, we might be stuck and say, well, it might be this or might be that, but at least we know it's not all of these other things. So any questions about this scientific process terminology? What will we use for the rest of the course? Okay, a lot of that con uh, comprehension exercise is about, you know, this stuff here too. Okay. All right. So um, let's do a quick eye clicker just to keep track of everybody who showed up today. And so I'll do a multiple choice starting now. Uh, and uh, so which of the four levels of selection from Nico Timbergen correspond to the most ultimate causation. So we use these terms ultimate and proximate. 
And uh, so one of them's one end of the scale, the other one's the other end of the scale. So is it phylogeny? Is it adapt adaptation or function? Is it ontogeny or is it mechanism? So go ahead and put your answer. These are only graded for completion, not correctness. Um, just I want you to get into the habit of thinking that, oh yeah, that's proximate, that's ultimate. And there's a, and just the continuum of I'm getting more and more proximate or I'm getting more and more ultimate. I'll give you a little bit of time there. Almost everybody's results are in. Getting a strong peak at one answer and a couple of side lobes. All right, so I'll just leave that up while we move on here. I think that's legal to do, but um, but so far, um, I'm seeing that most people are answering B, and uh, and that is that's what I'm looking for. So um, so good job to those who answered B. Uh, but um, to those who answered some of the others, it is sort of a continuum. And so um, although this is the most ultimate, you know, next down from that is phylogeny. So uh, this is the evolutionary baggage, and then from uh, adaptation to phylogeny, the next is the development. And then the next is mechanism. So proximate is uh, is the smallest time scale. It is the closest to the animal. It is the closest to the phenomenon. It is most proximate, most proximal. Um, ultimate is most distal. It is the farthest from the animal. It is acts across the largest of the time scales. What we mean by that? Okay. So I'll go ahead and stop that. All right, so our uh, last uh, you know, lecture was all about the cephalopod eye. What is the sensory system of the cephalopod have anything to do with behavior? And we can broaden that and say, why would an animal behaviorist care about sensory and perceptual experience at all? Uh, and, uh, and so you know, that brings me back to Von Uck school. So this is a hard tick, you know, and, uh, and so it's a uh, arachnid that uh, drinks blood of mammals. And, uh, and if we wanted to think, what is the world to a tick? Then uh, Von Uchtskull, uh was thinking about this and he said, you know, like the world to me and you is one thing, but the, what is the world to a tick? And a tick it is attracted to butyric acid. So this is a, uh, a metabolite that I think is released from bacteria in your gut that ends up being excreted. Uh, and, uh, and then it can be honed in on by, um, or honed in on by the tick. Um, it is also um, uh, attracted to warmth, and it likes hair. So these three things are the whole world to a tick. And so we could, when we talk about a tick, there's all sorts of questions we would ask, but it seems a little silly to ask some of them. So as an example, we could ask, you know, what color leaf does this tick prefer? Leafs and colors and leaf shapes don't even exist in the world of a tick. You know, that, that, that's just, that's not in the universe of the tick. Or the, so if you were to sort of give a tick a preference assay for different colors of leaves, then it, it would, uh, certainly if the tick has any preference, it would not be because of the color. It would be due to some correlate of color that might happen to fit within its world. But it's not like the leaf is something that we would expect the tick to be able to be processing behaviorally as a leaf. And so, um, so Von Eck school, uh, you know, yeah, so the leaf does not exist, the world to a tick. So Von Eck school was sort of saying that we need to sort of understand that different animals are going to have different worlds. And it's important for us to understand those worlds. And so his word for that was Umwelt. So the, uh, which is sort of, I think the German for, or related to environment, but you can also see Umwelt as kind of like a world. Um, and so this is the sensory perceptual world combined with the behavioral capabilities of an animal. 
So the first thing we usually have, like, a, you know, a PhD student who enters the lab working with an organism that they've never worked before do is get inside the umwelt of that organism to sort of say, before you do anything, and I'll get to that question in a second, um, we need to understand what, what world does this organism live in? Because it may not be your world. And you, in order for you to start asking questions about um, the world of this organism, you need to sort of understand what is the shape of that world, um, or else you'll ask a lot of questions that they might, you know, it might be feasible to do experiments that go, that go that way, but they might not be likely to come out to any interesting answers. The question? Well, this is a borrowed a word from German, Umwelt. So, so this is a term that we use to represent we can say, what is the umwelt of that animal? What is the umwelt of an ant? What is the umwelt of a tick? And umwelt is the sensory perceptual experience combined with the behavioral capabilities of that animal. So umwelt. And so I'll give examples of that here and why this is so hard to do. Um, so, you know, the claim here is that the behaviorist must try to understand the umwelt of the study organism in order to answer meaningful questions. But, you know, that's can be difficult to do here's uh you know several snakes have these things called pit organs and pit organs they detect heat but they basically can see infrared so snakes in their umwelt their sensory experience includes infrared biosonar bats which are mammals you know like us um and uh you know and uh, toothed uh, whales, dolphins, also mammals like us, you know, they have special adaptations, uh, special sense organs that allow them to do sonar, that allow them to make a, ch a chirp and then get a response back from that chirp and be able to locate things at very high resolution um, or just in general, see the world in a different way. You know, if you were in the ocean swimming next to a dolphin, for all I know, they would be able to see the inside of you by doing an ultrasound on you. That is just the world that they live in, is that is this acoustic uh, um, tapestry that gives them a sense that is nothing like any of our senses. You know, um, this army ant, Aceton burchellii, um, these are ants that are effectively blind. So these are ants that uh, there was an, an ancient uh, army ant that was evolved underground, lost its vision uh, because of that. Um, but then there was still a niche for these army ants. Uh, so a set of them came back up to the ground, didn't get their vision back. They can smell really well. They can touch. And uh, they, they, they go in these long foraging columns and they're, they're very conspicuous foraging columns. They're voracious predators. They're so good at what they do. There's a set of birds called ant birds, ant shrikes, that follow them around and will extra stuff that the blind army ants is, is, uh, has sort of overwhelmed but isn't carrying or whatever, then basically gets picked off by these ant birds. And so when you want to, listen or when you want to figure out where the army ants are you listen for the calls of the ant birds and then you go find the ant birds and they'll be falling around the army ants and the army ants you know they don't know the ant birds are there um so you know they have this very different sensory experience than we do than the birds that follow them around do um you know my dog dexter you know so uh you know this you know he looks a lot more like like me than she does but, uh, you know, but his nose, it's, it's, a, it's just shocking what that nose can do. And, and I just, I'd love to get inside his head to know what it must be like. There are no noxious odors. There's nothing that smells bad. It's just, you know, and he, he from yards away, you know, from like across a dog park, somebody opens a wrapper or a bag or something like that, and he is on it. You know, and, and it's just that that is not something that I have any sense of in any sense of the word. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, I, I don't, that's, that's my anecdotal, like, you know, for me, 
if something smells bad, very rarely do I, am I repelled from, or very rarely is he repelled from, certainly there are probably some smells I can give him to cause him to throw up, but it's, it's, it's not to me, like, like to him, it's, it's just like, it's rare for me to scan my eyes around and see something that causes me to recoil. And, but there's certain odors where I'm like, oh, sulfur, that's bad, you know? And, and I don't, I, and, and so it's like, to me, his nose is like my eyes is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, question or comment? Well, I'm saying that both of them have good senses of smell. So that, that these ants, um, you know, for example, these trails that you can see, these are all one species. They have multiple, um, these are sisters, uh, and there's some, uh, you know, interesting, uh, you know, results about, you know, how these different forms form. But basically, you can think of it as like, these are all very closely related ants that are fed different food, and uh, and that leads to them developing in different body plans. And so these are all one colony here, and they've got this long trail, and they will lay down a little bit of chemical on the ground, and uh, they have these pushing parties. And so the the ants will, the, if there's no chemical in front of them, the ants will walk forward, and when they they hit the end of that chemical, then they turn around because that's where the greatest chemical is and they walk back this way. But in doing so, they spread a little bit more chemical this way. And so if you find the end of one of these trails, you see this thing, it's called pushing party, where there's this writhing foam of ants that keeps going back and forth, getting longer and longer and longer, hopefully eventually coming across the burrow or the, the, the entrance to a nest of termites or a nest of other ants, uh, or um, are they, they're okay with you know a, a scorpion or you know anything they can find, then they'll take down because they immediately can smell and feel that it's there, have this response, and then carry it back in this highway system that they've built. Blind is you know totally blind, building effectively a highway system that allows them to send back to their bivouac to their home. Uh, this food item to feed these hungry larvae that are sitting there waiting um, down this conveyor belt that they've built with their bodies. And, uh, and that's all based basically off of roughly smell and, and a little bit of, of uh, tactile um, uh, ability. We discovered uh, with a postdoc of mine, uh, so really whenever I say we, it usually means someone else. So it's like, whenever I say I, I mean we, whenever I say we, I mean they. So uh, there was a postdoc of mine who was down in Panama that discovered that these uh, army ants, when they bump into each other, they actually form walls. In so when an army ant colony, one army ant colony bumps into another army ant colony, there's no benefit for them to, to that do and do an altercation. And so they actually form a temporary wall that looks a lot like a scab, like a bilayer of, of pairs of ants and all of the ants bump, bounce off the back of those ants until those two forging columns get pulled enough away from each other. And then like a scab flaking away, it then goes away and they go along their way. And again, that's all organized without vision. It's just, that is their world is olfaction and it works for them. You know, it's, um, it's kind of like that, uh, I, what was it, Apple had that Jason Momoa show C, where it's imagining a future where everyone's lost their vision and everybody's fine but they just live in a very different world. And that's kind of what we have to picture when we're thinking about these ants. And likewise, thinking about a dog or something like that. The other example of this, um, so these, um, these uh, I think uh, blue capped uh, uh, um, cordon blues. Um, so I don't know if the audio will play, but the, the point will still work. So I've so far talked about different sensory abilities so olfaction like you know a diff, you know seeing infrared these cordon blues uh, until several years ago people didn't realize that they could do this so let's see It'd be nice if we get audio well i get audio but um you don't let me yeah i might be able to do that and um but if not, I can make this work just with vision. 
or just with the, the site here. So let me give this a shot. All right, turn this off. All right, well, let's help make this full screen and get rid of this. All right. It's not going to be that. Clay, carries a little uh, a little straw in its, its mouth there, and it trips. <laughs> but when people slow down the video by ten times, they realize that actually there was a sophisticated hacking that was going on between that um, that. But it turns out ah. that these individual leg movements here are really So it's this complex multimodal between Vibratory signals going here, uh, and you've got the acoustic signals all kind of combined together. And um, uh, she also does this kind of tap dance back and forth. So they have a different perceptual experience than we do, uh, in that they're either able to see or hear, you know, this, which to us uh, happens in an instant. So, you know, how do they measure time? They don't know. Like to them, there's a second, like four seconds to us. I, I don't know. Um, but that's what I mean is if you think about the sensory system with examples, it's not just what. Other types of sensors, but even sensors that they that we share, they can do all the same. The acoustics being slowed down is super creepy. Um, so let me. No problem. So the whole side of the side is the kind of repeat of that. I'm sorry, say that again. Bill's tap dance was the reverse of the females, and then she has an extra sound. It very well could mean if you did an ethogram, um, you know, then I think that's what in this paper they were actually uh, analyzing exactly that. So this is a paper that um, you can actually, if you, uh, the, I think if you download the PDF of this lecture, you can click on it and I've linked to the paper, but it's a scientific reports paper. So it's open access, it's easy to get to, you can look for that, that title. And they have all of this as supplementary, the videos of supplementary information. And um, and they I do an analysis and this uh, lead author uh, Nawa Ota has done several other papers about uh, the cordon bleu since then where they've better tried to analyze this back and forth. So if you're interested, I definitely encourage you to to take a look. All right, let's get back to here. I'm still sharing. Good. All right. So um, a bunch of examples here where these are animals with very different sensory experience than us. So we, when we want to study these things, have to try to consider the umwelt of, you know, like to get inside these animals to really ask, you know, what are the interesting how and why questions related to this animal's sensory and uh, um, perceptual experience and their behavioral capabilities. But that's really difficult because we have an umwelt, you know, so that 
we live in a world uh, where nominally speaking, you know, our, the, the, the kind of typical modalities for most humans are primarily visual, um, some acoustic, you know, a little bit of vibratory, but, you know, but, it, but a lot of that other stuff takes a backseat to, you know, vision. And, um, and like I said, and, and, you know, so you could probably rank those, but, you know, if we, but that experience, you know, like, again, I, I can't see sonar. I can't see infrared. My vision is just within a very narrow range that other animals are shifted so that they can see into the ultraviolet, into the infrared. And when you're considering, you know, setting up an experiment, even like showing an animal a computer screen, I have to ask myself, what is the spectrum of that computer screen? Are there additional colors that I can't see that another animal might be seeing? So that if I do a playback experiment, I might think that I'm showing them one thing, but I'm actually showing them something else. So these are all things that are really difficult to wrap your head around because you experience your world one way and you're studying an organism that experiences a completely different world. Does that make, is that clear what I mean by umwelt? Here, this this idea that you can live in a totally different world if you have a different sensory system. Okay. All right, great. Um, so, um, sensory uh, physiology is certainly important. What what other aspects of physiology are important to animal behavior? Um, and that's when I want to bring up this example of these ring doves. Uh, so the the uh let's see, I'll turn off that so this is a ring dove uh, otherwise known as a barbary dove uh it's you know looks like a dove looks like some of the standard you know doves pigeons a columbidae uh that you would see around you know campus or something like that uh, a ring dove uh some of the things that i'm talking about here are also in common with other doves ring doves just happen to be organisms where this has been well studied in um, doves are uh, an interesting set. Uh, it, well, so you know they're birds, so they lay eggs. Uh, those eggs turn into little dove chicks that grow into bigger dove chicks that eventually grow into doves. You know, reproductive cycle. Doves do have one interesting wrinkle, and in that doves make milk. Um, so that uh, you can actually they have a crop um, inside them, and they can feed their chicks milk that they make. And both the men, the men, the males and the females are able to make this milk and they do make this milk. And that kind of gets to the heart of like the, you know, when we think about the behavior of the ring dove, um, it really is necessary for us to dig down into the physiology to make sense of some of the crazy stuff that we see. So for example, just a description of a simple ring dove, a typical ring dove mating cycle here. And so male and female come together and if you were to look at the metabolites in the blood of the male, you'd find there's a bunch of androgen hormones like testosterone floating around. And that generally is necessary for him to start his courtship behavior. So he starts doing courtship displays. I'm sorry, I don't have a video on here. And then the couple, after he starts doing courtship displays, uh, will start building a nest. And as they start building that nest, and then he continues to do this courtship display, if you just sample her blood, then she gets this follicle-stimulating hormone starting to circulate from her pituitary gland, and, uh, and that starts to cause changes in her. Now, what's interesting is that these changes seem to be triggered by auditory and visual cues. So it's not that she's taking in a chemical necessarily, there is her sensory experience is causing a change in her pituitary, which is causing her body to produce this hormone. And a hormone is just a chemical signal for inside the body, whereas a pheromone is a chemical signal between two individuals. And that chemical signal triggers a cascade of other reproductive developmental changes in her leading to estrogen release which causes her to grow her ovaries and, uh, and develop them and be ready for copulation. So copulation occurs. And then uh, after that, they continue to build the nest together. The nest presence seems to stimulate progesterone in both the male and the female. So now if you sample both of their blood metabolites, 
you would see this in both parents. And, um, and then that progesterone is what causes them to start both, well, so basically progesterone, sorry, um, this uh, promotes incubation behavior by both parents. So that ends up, I guess I'll back up here. So both the male and the female incubate that egg. And then that incubation behavior after you've incubated. And so you can imagine a series of behavioral experiments where they set up an experiment where they stop this process at different points and they change something and see if the process continues as it normally does. And they built up knowledge that they know what the different stimuli that cause these are, are the triggers for these things. And they know that the process of incubating these eggs stimulates the release of another uh, chemical, prolactin, uh, also from the pituitary. That inhibits hormones that would promote sexual behavior. So it basically turns off the, uh, the, the mating uh, tendency for these birds so that they shift entirely into a parental mode. And, uh, and what's interesting is you can take a male and put him behind glass and just have him watch a female incubate. And a male watching a female behind glass incubate, that is enough of seeing the act of incubation for the male to start producing prolactin, which inhibits his uh, desire to, um, to continue to do courtship. So the visual sim the si the seeing that act is enough to trigger these behavioral or these physiological changes. That is what causes both parents to produce milk that they can then feed to this chick. The chick grows and grows and eventually fledges. And as it gets closer to fledging, it, uh, you know, it drinks, it, as it fledges, it drinks less of this crop milk. Um, that ends up turning off the prolactin, which will then turn back on the testosterone and all of the other things that go into the courtship. And you go back around to the top again, and they're both ready uh, to start this mating dance all over again. So we could describe that all in terms of behavior. And, but if you were, then you'd, you'd stop at all these points. You'd say, wait, they both start producing milk at the same time. They both produce milk at the same time. How did you get synchronized milk production you know, you would think all of those physiological changes might be happening in the female. Um, so what's going on in the male? How did that happen? And it was only by, to understand how all of this behavior occurred, it required also drilling down into the endocrinology. So, you know, where does behavior stop? It's, it's unclear um, because, you know, a lot of times you really need these down deep mechanisms to make sense of the behavior. So endocrinology is very important. Uh, uh, neuro, uh, 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 neuroscience is important. In fact, there's a whole field of neuroethology, which is studying the, the neurological correlates of behavior. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we have to sort of think about all of these mechanistic constraints and opportunities that are provided by us. And, uh, and that's what I'm hoping this story is kind of showing you here. And it isn't, of course, just the endocrine system. So as I was kind of talking about, you know, we also have to think about neurological mechanisms. We have to think about the sensory biology, we already talked about the umwelt, and this general physiology. So the energetics of everything, how expensive is it to do a particular behavior? And also the biomechanics, uh, you know, is it actually possible to fly with wings that are this, this way and so on and so forth? All of these things come together. So the mechanism here, in order to really, you know, they're, they're, these are sort of the four different legs of the table that is the mechanism. And by understanding these four different legs, it helps us better understand these constraints because different mechanisms can lead to different behavioral solutions. So when we're talking about behavior, it's a little bit like the umwelt. We really need to understand what the animal has to work with or what did evolution have to work with. So, you know, with animals, with, you know, with birds, you have a particular physiology. So there are a particular set of behaviors that might be more likely to evolve. Uh, 
I study ants. Uh, there, um, some of you might know that that social insects, at least uh, uh, Hymenoptera, so ants, bees, and wasps, are examples of haplodiploid uh, organisms. That means that all of the females have two sets of chromosomes, but the males only have one set of chromosomes. And it turns out that that weird genetic architecture may actually make it much easier for hypersociality to evolve. That seems kind of a crazy leap that the number of copies of genes that are in the male are going to affect whether you get hypersocial behavior in a large group. But knowing, you know, because we now know, we've worked through the theories, we understand how that works, then that does make us ask the question, you know, what, you know, what is the ploidy of this particular organism and what might that tell us about its behavior? And so, uh, so yeah, knowing about these mechanisms tells us about these different types of behaviors. And then the other thing I want to flip that around and say, for those of you who are going to or have read this reading exercise that's due Sunday, uh, I picked that out because I like it because it also goes in the other direction. So this is a case that those that I won't go into the details so that I won't spoil things too much, but they're basically studying, it's a conservation problem, of studying the effect of these, these chemicals that are being leached into the environment of these fish and, uh, and, and actually changing their behavior. And when they had done environmental impacts statements or, or studies of this before, they only did it from a physiological perspective. And they said that these uh, basically environmental estrogens do not seem to cause any changes in sperm production in males. So it should be totally fine. Same amount of sperm should be totally fine. But what they'll find in this paper is that it changed the behavior of the males. And that behavior change changed how successful they were at mating. And so even though physiologically they're producing the same amount of sperm, they're not producing the same amount of offspring. And the mechanism that is leading them to not produce the same amount of offspring isn't some metabolite circulating in their blood. It is how they behave. They behave in a particular way that makes them not very competitive to other males, even other males that are also swimming in this same stuff. So it shows here that not only does endocrinology or does behavior need endocrinology to understand what sort of behaviors are possible, but if you're really doing a study of you know, the effect of chemicals on an organism, you have to not only think about the kind of very, very proximate of well, what happens inside that organism, but also the slightly less proximate of how do the behavior changes affect the social system that these organisms live in. So we need both behavior and mechanism together as what I'm trying to say here by coupling this with that past story. All right. So any questions about those things, about the value of endocrinology and how it fits together with behavior. Or just in general, I don't mean to pick on just endocrinology, but, uh, but in general, we, as behaviorists, it's not all about making observations of you know, animals in Skinner boxes. Um, the kind of what we've learned through the ethology as it's matured up through the behavioral ecology is to get a really good picture, we really need to be considering not only what's going outside the skin, but what's going inside the skin as well. Okay. All right, so um, another quick one of these, and then we've just got a little bit of wrap up here. So I'll go ahead and start this poll. Um, and this is, I guess, a short answer. So a little vocab thing here. What's the word that animal behaviorists use to describe the sensory perceptual behavioral world of an animal, of an organism. So um, the environment around an organism or the world that the organism lives in, seeing through its sensory systems. What is that word? Let's see what we've got over here. Uh, pardon? 
the it, I think it's up. Yeah, I think people are responding. Okay, great. So um, most everybody's um, responded. Um, um, the I saw at least a couple of ticks and myrmecologies, which I appreciate because um, the tick was involved. Um, but uh, answer I was looking for here was uh, was umwelt um, or some spelling of umwelt. Um, so so that is good. Um, good a good word to learn. Um, but then closing out here, I do want to at least mention a couple other things that I think you'll find on the, the UCE. So looking ahead, next unit is behavioral genetics, where we're going to involve the gene in these discussions. And, and so that is another way that we have to think about when we talk about constraining behavior. And, and you know, in, just, in general, evolution shows up on that Timbergans 4. Evolution is a change in gene frequencies and allele frequencies in a population. Now we have to think about what are the different forces of evolution? What are different ways to change um, the, the frequencies of genes? Um, I guess I'll just ask that. Like, What's, what's one way that, that uh, allele frequencies are changed in populations? Yeah. Well, Well, I guess is there a name for this this process that I guess I'm saying that when we, we talk, we think about like 181, 182, we're, we're thinking about sort of processes that we would, a general term for these sorts of things, yeah. Mutation is one of them. Mutation, how does it change? It, it introduces variation by adding new genes at a slow rate. Selection, natural selection, that uh, will amplify certain things that have adaptive value. Oh, pardon? Genetic drift. Um, uh, genetic drift is a trick. It is one that I'm looking for. It's a tricky one. Uh, how? Who does anyone have a good definition, or maybe you, uh, to what genetic drift is? Uh, it randomly due to chance. It definitely is involved. Um, if it, with it. Um, does anybody have like any other sort of examples of of or yeah, you know, something that adds a little bit more clarity. That could be a large portion of the population gets wiped out. Yeah. Uh, founder effect. Yeah, the, these are all things that could lead to sort of drift. Yeah. Well, the flow, so gene flow, that's something I would call migration. Um, so that would be another one of those things. So genetic drift, I think, is the trickiest one. And I, I, these are the four that I was looking for. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about drift here. And we'll talk about it you know, next uh, week as well. But there are two forces that reduce diversity. And uh, one of them is natural selection. So basically, there are selective pressures against certain uh, alleles. And so their proportion declines in the population. So you go from having every allele to having more of some and less of others. So you get a less diversity in populations. And if this goes too fast, you can sort of converge on, you know, a strategy that may not be the best um, in some sort of optimality sense. So, you know, this diversity, uh, 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 the fact that it's taking diversity away actually reduces its ability to find novel solutions later. And then genetic drift, that also reduces diversity. Genetic drift is a random effect that mainly it happens in small populations. And it does, you know, sometimes we summarize it saying it's kind of due to bad luck. But what we mean by bad luck is we mean that if like a population can only support 100 individuals and, you know, Oh, the, the 100 previous individuals produce 200 more, and there's no real difference between those 200 individuals, there's no fitness difference, then just a random 100 of them happen to find food. 
And so that's what we mean by genetic drift. It's like due, it's not due to a selection effect. It's just due to the fact that there's a limited resources. And so there is a small probability that you're just not going to make it. And in large populations, this doesn't have much of an effect. But in small populations, you can purge all your diversity just accidentally. So if you're in a population of, you know, 10 individuals, and I say only five of you get to pass the class, then there's, uh, you know, the, it might be that it just happens to be that all I, that, that nobody with a blue shirt passes the class. And that's not because blue shirts are bad. It's just that in a random selection of 10 individuals, there might only be one blue shirt. And it's very unlikely that one blue shirt is going to be in the five that get randomly picked. And that's genetic drift. That's how it purges that diversity. So the only way, you know, dr drift uh, naturally leads to fixation where you just get one allele through a whole population. And it has nothing to do with how good that allele is. It's just mathematically, that's where it leads. That's the equilibrium point. You get less and less diversity over time. But then we do have things that increase diversity. And one of them is mutation, random mutations. Uh, but that's really, really slow. Um, and so in small populations, then maybe there's going to be this interesting balance between mutation and drift that kind of keeps them at bay. Um, but, uh, you know, you can't kind of count on mutation to being to introduce a whole lot of variation. But then a little bit faster is then migration. So gene flow. So you've got additional individuals in nearby populations. They interbreed with your population, and then suddenly you introduce a whole bunch more diversity. And these are the four main forces behind evolution. And when we think about behavior, we have to think about it, you know, what behaviors can evolve. And we have to also, just like with the mechanisms, so just like we're asking what behaviors can be built out of these mechanisms, we also have to ask what behaviors um, can come out of these evolutionary processes, and not all of them are functional. And so it might be that the reason why you see um, a bunch of ants uh, behaving in a particular way, you know, following light, you know, if you shine a light on them, they end up going the other way. You could come up with an adaptive explanation, or it could be a product of drift. It could be that the ants that ignored light um, were just as fine as the ants that ran away from the light. Um, and due to drift, it just purged one of them. And the one that got purged at random was the one that didn't care about light. You know, that could be an explanation. So we need tools, and there are tools in genomics that can actually try to measure the relative contribution of each one of these four so that we can test hypotheses about was this behavior under selection? Did this seem to be growing throughout the phylogeny in a way that would be consistent with selective pressure? Or do we see a pattern that is much more consistent with drift or with random mutation and so on? So that's why we really need the genetics when we think about behavior as well. All right, any questions about that? Yeah. I mean, there's certain, I think the, the way we think about migration and behavioral patterns, what might be, um, you know, where do we get a particular behavior? And through evolutionary history, maybe we see that when, uh, you know, continents came together, that suddenly there was an, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a, a certain group that, that came into, you know, that other group and that, you know, like those are sort of changes that, that might create a sudden spontaneous injection of, new genetic material or something like that. So, I mean, but I guess the point though, I'm not saying is not just to pick directly on drift, but when we're thinking about behavioral diversity over the planet, um, that's a macroevolutionary question of like, why do we have that behavioral diversity? And it could be that every novel behavior maps functionally to something interesting in that area. And it's the perfect fit for that area. 
or it could be that um, each one of these little sections is reproductively isolated from itself now. And when they became isolated, they became small subpopulations free to drift away to any solution that they wanted. And there actually were not, there's no fitness difference, but because they're separated, this one purged this allele and this one purged this allele. And when we look across the diversity, then we see diversity just because there wasn't gene flow. But then when there is gene flow, then, uh, then we might expect that type of diversity to get purged. And if we do see diversity because there is gene flow, then that probably knocks out the drift. And maybe that really is a, a, you know, a shadow of what's underneath it all. Uh, but then we always have to ask, too, what's the natural background rate of random mutations, you know, too? So that's what I mean. We just when we look at these giant patterns, we can't just always assume it's one of these. We have to really um, exclude the other ones and see how they all work together. Any other questions about this? And hopefully it's clear what I mean by reducing diversity and increasing diversity. All right. So yeah, each of these can constrain and generally shape behavior, not just natural selection. That's all I was kind of saying there. And um, so uh, I think this was just a reminder the A's are due on Sunday, the B's will be due next Sunday, the reading is already available and I'll get this out to as soon as possible. And uh, I think I'm going to have you do one last one of these just to keep you here to reward those who stayed. <laughs> well, it's all participation though. So, you know, as long as you hit a certain fraction. So what is the evolutionary force in one word or two? that reduces variation in small populations due to bad luck. So not due to uh, a function or an adaptation. And that's all I've got for you. So I hope you have a good weekend. We'll see you Tuesday. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, that's weird. Um, could you like go back and refresh? Yeah. Well, you can, um, when you're, if you leave the student view, uh, you can take the test and you test, you take it as the test student, but you can also hit the preview button on it. And then that will show you what it looks like as well. Or you can even, I don't know if it's a TA you can edit, but I can also change your access, but um, try like that. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, use, um, so UCA, that one there. And um, if you scroll back, right. Um, Scroll to the top. Yeah, you don't want to do next. Um, hit the little three dots. And um, yeah, there should be. Well, I will double check it, what I need to turn on access for you. But worst comes to worst, yeah, you, you, you can do view it as a student, and that should work. Uh -huh. the, their perusal assignments, the AREs. So they're reading so you you you're given a like a seven or eight page paper to read and you leave comments on it as you read and that's how you score points by leaving comments it should be common about that so if you read something and you see something interesting that you would like to ask a, a question about or if you see other people that commented you can respond to their comments that's what i was looking for for that one yep yeah, you can go ahead and do that. Yeah, I think uh -huh. I was actually going to the comment in the paper. Uh huh.